The Blue Lagoon is neither an adventure film nor romance. It's a goddamn mystery movie shrouded in an enigma because no matter how much you think about it and try and work it all out, you'll never, ever figure out just how in the fuck it ever got made. Never mind dark matter or quantum mechanics, The Blue Lagoon defies all logic of the physical universe by its mere existence. That alone is its most impressive feat. It got made. Somehow, this plotless, hanky-panky teen fantasy film birthed itself into existence. I suppose in that sense, it don't matter all that much that the movie itself is shit. <laughs> so get your Adam and Eve on and say, how you doing to your inner pedo? Because with one big ass tidal wave of lusty teen thirst, we're diving in. Right, so the beginning of this movie is totally pointless. All you need to know is that these two little shits and this old man end up on a tropical island after their ship goes up in flames and they conveniently get separated from the boy's daddy. The two kids are cousins, by the way, because, uh, incest. Once on the island, the old man who speaks nothing but gibberish teaches the boy how to make shelter, which leads into him becoming a carpenter of Jesus-like proportions, and the girl into... Um, not eating these berries and perfecting her immaculate makeup. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's the magical island of Maybelline. After that, the old man sees some nasty shit on the other side of the island, so he tells the kids to never go there, because that's where the boogeyman lives, then gets drunk on rum and drinks himself to death. I guess because he had the self-awareness to realise the script no longer needed him. After finding his corpse, the kids cry for a bit, then go for a swim. Fast forward seven years and they're thriving beyond any conceivable measure, where the boy has made this swanky little pad for the two of them, is a superb fisherman and likes to play with his dick. The girl, in truly modern fashion, is perfect just the way she is and doesn't need to do anything useful or of any value, so she just sits about looking pretty like your everyday Instagram thought. Fun facts, during production the crew was concerned about her little titties getting caught on camera, so every day the makeup team glued her hair to her chest. Gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, splitting hairs. Brooke Shields herself landed this role because of her performance in Pretty Baby, where she played a 12-year-old prozzy. You little Lolita, you. Dude. But sorry to all the pedos out there watching this, but the girl swimming butt naked in the ocean was actually some 32-year-old swimmer who just happened to have no chest as well. Reading this stuff reminded me of when Kira Knightley went topless to protest photoshopping for some reason, not realising how her chest in particular is the very reason photoshopping exists. It would have made more sense if she went topless for Pancake Day. Anyway, the two teens are now getting thirsty, but due to their ignorance about virtually fucking everything, including fucking, they don't know what it is they suddenly see in each other. What are you looking at? Your muscles. And something inside her stirs. One day, the girl starts bleeding in the lagoon and calls the boy for help, only to realise it's her who's bleeding, out of a place she doesn't want the boy to see, so she aptly tells him to piss off. Later, the boy starts trying to clap her up for a little he doesn't even know what yet, and even tries to pull off a Prince Charming on her sleeping beauty ass, but his thirsty hands wake her up and she gives him the brush off again. All our boy can do in the meantime, like many a basement dweller the world over today, is keep on cranking him out on his little lonely. One day, the girl wanders to the Forbidden Zone and finds this Maui-like stone idol thing there, which, like her, is bleeding, so she thinks the place is holy and the thing is not the boogeyman, but actually God. Never underestimate the narcissistic delusions of a pretty modern white girl. Because she blueballed and friendzoned him, the boy goes ape about her going over to the Forbidden Zone of the island, because clearly he doesn't understand women yet. Despite speaking often about getting rescued by daddy, when a ship passes by the island for the first time in fucking years, the girl doesn't bother with lighting the signal fire they had set up. The boy comes back from a forage to see the ship go bye-bye and gives the girl what for. Even though she rejected his ass, she tells him the island is now their home, so fuck civilization, all to the disbelieving ears of the boy. After giving each other a good old troll, the girl threatens telling his daddy about the boy's fap sessions. Not sure how, but whatever. So he launches a coconut at her. She tosses one back, popping him one on the noggin. Guilty, the girl runs over to the boy, but he bitch slaps her and wishes her dead. Cause she won't give it up, he kicks her out of their crib, tossing her shit out like a bitch. The pretty but useless girl sets up this crappy shelter for herself right by the shoreline, so soon stupidly steps on a stonefish. Finding her near death's door, girl begs boy to see God, so he carries her up there like a simp. They pray and all that over the stone, and somehow this rejuvenates the girl. 
Because he helped her out, our boy's finally in for some action. After a skinny dip in sesh, they kiss for the first time, then get their Marvin Gaye on. From here on out, girl and boy are inseparable. Surprise, surprise, with all sky rockets and cream pies in flight, the girl soon lands herself in the pudding club. The kids, and I feel this is a bit of a stretch, don't know what's up with the girl's bumpy belly. All they seem to know is that something's grown inside her. Because this makes her not want any action, the boy starts calling her fat. One night, girl goes missing, so boy goes into jungle to find her, but is lured in by the sound of drums. Once upon the altar, he sees a native tribe perform a human sacrifice, and after bricking it, the girl's screams lead him to her whereabouts. Out pops a baby, no problemo, which they name after the pointless old man. In the original 1908 book, yeah, this was a published novel too, they named the boy Hannah, because in their past life, the only baby they ever saw was called Hannah. Lol. So boy and girl and pointless old man junior start playing happy families, but pointless old man junior won't eat. Just before committing infanticide thinking their rugrats retarded, pointless old man junior suckles on girl's breast. Boy tells girl what went down at God's place, vowing to spear them like a fish if they ever get any dirty ideas. The indigenous tribe of whatever are never to be seen again though, so why they appeared in the fucking movie is a total mystery. Point is old man Junior grows a bit, he models for the album cover of Nirvana's Nevermind and all is well with the world. But then daddy suddenly pops back into the fray because he's apparently been looking for the kids for seven odd years and never come across this island until now. But the kids are having a mud wrestling party so he doesn't think it's them. Maybe he didn't think they'd commit incest either I guess. The kids see it as well but remain unfazed, not seeing much reason to leave their little haven anymore. Maybe if they knew the huge likelihood of their kid dying in such an environment, they'd reconsider. But naturally, they ain't got a fucking Scooby. The boy rows out alone one day and sees the skeleton of Pointless Old Man, where he deduces that he too is built the same way and will one day die as well. No idea why this was put in, except maybe as an omen or wink to the ending. Other than that, it's as pointless as the fucking old man. Right, let's get off this goddamn rock already. During a forage, the boy collects some bananas whilst the girl tends to the kid, only to totally overlook how the kid is collecting the very berries the pointless old man warned her about. Because the script needs the berries on the boat, that's where pointless old man Junior dumps them, all without eating any because he can't do that till they're lost at sea. Because she's only looking after her baby, the girl takes a nap on the boat whilst they wait for the boy, only to be awakened by the wave crashing sound of an oar that the kid poured into the ocean like a cat. Stupid incest baby. She tries hooking it back with the other oar, but because she's just as useless as the baby, she cries for the boy. Thinking this chore will get him laid again, the boy eagerly dives into the ocean, but... Oh no! For the first time ever in this silly little film, fucking Jaws is on the lurk about. Writing advice! Instead of the stupid tribe that led to nothing, we should have been introduced to the shark at an earlier point. Maybe with a dead baby shark like they had in the beach or something. I don't know, it's not my script. But having the shark only ever pop up at this precise moment with the suicide berries conveniently aboard their dinghy and the lackadaisical girl taking a snooze whilst out of fucking sea is nothing but a hat-trick's worth of awful fucking writing. Anyhow, the boy gets to the dinghy before he's eaten alive but only after the girl throws the last oar at the shark. That's how they conveniently end up shit creek without a paddle. After a couple of days, girl and boy both wake up from a nap to see pointless old man Junior chowing down on them berries. Oh no. By this time, the boy recommends they Romeo and Juliet it along with pointless old man Junior and gulp down them berries as well. In all likelihood, these kids would be absolute savages after seven years on this poxy island. So I think it's more likely they'd have a good old barbecue with that baby. But what do I know? Just to add in a cop-out ending, Daddy then happens to find the dinghy and the kids. Instead of pronouncing them dead, they're still breathing. And that's a fin to the film. Instead of a tragic romance ending, which would have kinda worked, we get this ambiguous drivel instead. Ugh. Assuming pointless old man was right about the berries though, those kids are about to die, horribly, right in front of Daddy's eyes after he sailed the high seas for seven goddamn years trying to find them. Savage. Right, well, I'm not really sure what else there is to say about this film. Again, it exists. It can be proud of itself for that. I guess a lot of people these days would label this film child prawn, but it's not at all, unless you're so prudish that any underage nudity whatsoever constitutes such a thing. However, just to contradict myself, whilst the film isn't prawnographic, 
its premise still is. Pitching this film to a Hollywood producer or porn production company, not that there's any difference between the two, would result in more or less the same film. Given the news surrounding Hollywood over recent years, you gotta wonder whether that's how it got made. Maybe the Blue Lagoon is Pedo Island, hiding in plain fucking sight. Oh yeah, there's this one bit that stuck out to me, where the film shows a pair of breasts in this shot here, meant to be Brooke's but clearly belonging to a fully grown woman, only to soon show Brooke a few takes down the line, flatter than a teenage mutant Kira Knightley pancake. I'm not sure why I'm mentioning this, but unlike the girl's chest, it just stuck out. And that feeling of confusion sums up the Blue Lagoon for me. It's a mystery movie, wrapped in pancake porn.